Ray Dalio's Bridgewater is expecting a stock market crash, and they're worth paying attention to. You know, not only because they're one of the largest hedge funds in the world managing, you know, over a hundred billion dollars, you know, and also Ray Dalio has an incredible investment framework to consider, you know, looking at how the macro picture works, but they've crushed it. You know, during the first half of the year, their flagship fund was up 32%, completely crushing the competition. Co-CIO, so co-chief investment officer who's leading this strategy Greg Jensen, he recently did an interview on Bloomberg talking about how he sees stocks and bonds, U.S. assets declining, let's say 20 to 25 percent based on Federal Reserve quantitative tightening. Now, this is worth understanding a bit because he's talking about, let's say, a portfolio of risk assets, both stocks and bonds. Traditionally, you have something like the 60, 40, you know, portfolio, 60 percent stocks, 40 percent bonds. Maybe you're talking about now 30 percent bonds, 70 percent stocks, something like that. Either way, if he's talking about a 20, 25% decline, what he's really suggesting is that bonds might decline 10% and then you'll have this much bigger decline with equity. So if, you know, let's say you're looking at shorter dated bonds, maybe that declines, you know, three to 5%, maybe more. Um, longer dated bonds certainly have that risk of, of much greater declines uh, as, you know, interest rates move up. But really that means that the bulk of the decline is going to have to come from equities. You know, if, if bond portfolio declines 5%, then you're going to need to see a lot more of a decline in equities to get to that 20 to 25% drop that Greg Jensen's talking about. And so maybe a 30% plus drop for stocks, depending on, you know, which, you know, stocks you're looking at, the more levered or the more problematic, the higher beta stocks could certainly see even greater declines. So the question is, why is Ray Dalio's Bridgewater seeing such huge downside for U.S. assets. So there's a couple of key themes here, one of which is the aspect of stubborn inflation. And you see the idea of inflation being sticky or stubborn from a couple of key themes. One is this idea of nearshoring or onshoring, saying, hey, because of geopolitical dynamics, companies and governments aren't going to say, hey, what's the best return on equity or return on investment? We need to make sure we have a stable supply chain. That might be energy. That might be green initiatives. That might be driven by, you know, just po political aspects saying, hey, we do not want to manufacture these in China or we're concerned about our semiconductor supply chain. So those types of things do add to inflation. There's more to inflation than just, you know, where where do we actually manufacture goods? Another key aspect is labor, where you look at the labor market. This is the tightest it's been in several decades. Very tight, very nice. And so looking at that, you see super tight labor market. And then you look at the profit margins of effectively corporate corporate America near multi-decade highs. You can go back several decades and see this is near record territory, you know, that you're looking at. And yeah, if businesses are having record profits and you're having people say, man, the last few years have been super tough. Inflation's high. The consumer's getting squeezed. The worker's getting squeezed. You see all these trends like, oh, quiet quitting. This is the trend of sort of saying labor wants a bigger part of that share. And when you see businesses at record margins, that I'd argue means, you know, the, the makes the argument that, yeah, you could see this margin take a hit over time as labor gets a bigger part of the pie. And we'll see how that plays out. Now, in response to elevated inflation, which is, you know, what you see with labor making more money, or you see with the onshoring, nearshoring, just higher cost of, you know, manufacturing goods, in response to elevated inflation, the Federal Reserve is going to continue drawing up liquidity. And that's what Jerome Powell said effectively at the recent Jackson Hole meeting just this past Friday saying, look, our mandate's 2% inflation, 2%. They're not there yet. Now, you are going to see a lot of like ping pong, like volatility. Oh, inflation this month's only 6%. Huzzah. It's like, no, folks, like there's over extrapolation that you're going to see over and over again on Wall Street. Oh, it went from 9% to 8%. Next up's two. That's not how it works. These things will be lumpy. It'll it'll jump around a bit. But as long as inflation remains elevated, which it very likely will, and it will not hit that 2% target, the Federal Reserve isn't going to be quick to lower rates. And that is arguably what Wall Street was expecting. Wall Street's saying, oh, they're going to do this quick tightening. And next year, they're going to be back to easing. Huzzah, rah, rah, rally with some of these great stocks. But that's not what we're seeing, arguably, here, which is effectively saying, hey, Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell saying, yeah, we might have to keep rates higher for longer just to make sure we get to that 2% 
rate of inflation. Now, this is a reversal of decades of easy monetary policies. And you can see how the Federal Reserve balance sheet has exploded over the last few decades, now around $9 trillion. And we're just starting to go through the reversal of this. The reversal of their balance sheet is down. It's down to something like a little over 1%. You can see, you know, previously back 2008, before the, you know, around the great financial crisis, you're looking at a balance sheet that was closer to 1 trillion. Now it's closer to $9 trillion. This is a huge reversal, a huge headwind. And despite what I'd argue is the challenge as the Federal Reserve sort of tightens with higher interest rates, tightens with quantitative tightening, very tight. As the Federal Reserve continues to tighten, that's going to hurt the economy. That's going to hurt earnings. And that's not what's getting priced into the market. You know, the, what, what effectively Wall Street is pricing in is, hey, we're expecting earnings to continue marching higher. 2023, maybe earnings go up another 10%, maybe up another 8%. We're expecting, and that's what Wall Street's expecting. And as long as there's this divergence, that creates the problem that, wait a second, that's not the reality of what he's seeing. And so, once again, Greg Jensen saying, we're still seeing something like 25 to 30% above the normal relationship between cash flows and asset prices, which means there's a significant decline to come to align the real economy with the financial economy. That's honestly a nerd's way of saying like, oh, things are a bit expensive. That's honestly what he's saying. He's saying 25 to 30% misaligned. Look, I, I love nerds. Nerds rule the world. I'm not trying to put down Greg Jensen. You know, he, he's crushing it. But what I'm saying is like talking about financial economy versus financial assets. And it makes sense when you have monetary policies that sort of move cash, you know, to push financial assets that doesn't necessarily feed into will this company make more cash. Um, and so that's what you I, I think I, in fairness, I'm probably you know, you can put the nerd cap on me too. Uh, after all, I have a, a channel dedicated to investing here on YouTube. Um, so here it is, he's effectively saying, yeah, there's this reset with valuations that has, you know, it's going to take some time, you know, the, this is a multi year, multi decade trend, arguably, where you've seen valuations expand, where you've seen that the difference between, you know, the cash flows and the assets asset prices have diverged. And he's saying that needs to reset. Okay, so what do I think, you know, sort of happens from here? If you're struggling with this investment environment, consider unrivaledinvesting.com for new ideas and a community of like minded investors. And full disclosure, this is not financial advice. So as I consider what's going on, I think the key aspect, I think it's always important to, you know, ask yourself, well, where could I be wrong here? And the crux of the thesis here is that Inflation remains sticky. Inflation remains stubbornly high, well above 2%, and that the Federal Reserve sort of has to accommodate that. And Jerome Powell will say, hey, we're going to do what it takes to get it to 2%. So there's a couple of ways that inflation, you know, a couple of ways that the thesis doesn't work out, according to Jensen. Right now, I'm in their camp saying, hey, there's still huge downside. That's, you know, that makes sense based on what he's saying. You have this inflation, you have the Federal Reserve tightening, don't fight the Fed. It's going to create a lot of pressure with stocks and bonds and arguably the economy in general. So I'm, I'm in that camp, but let's, you know, let's play the sort of how could I be wrong? You know, let's do a sort of a pre-mortem of where you could be wrong. Well, one is if inflation, you know, comes in, you know, a lot lower and just hits that 2% sooner than people expect. And if that's the case, then it's like, okay, things are better. Right now, the data is not suggesting that. And you do have supply chain challenges with, let's say, some core commodities like oil, which ultimately feed into, you know, oil and energy prices, which ultimately feed into food. And you're seeing in some places, let's say in Europe, some core commodities further coming off the market, which is going to result in even higher food prices. So I do not see the data points suggesting, oh, inflation is going to hit that 2%. I, I'm just not seeing that. That, that, at this point, but let's let's take it one quarter at a time, one month at a time. Um, so that's you know, let's say inflation you know is solved. Now it's going to be volatile, and that will drive volatility with the stock market. So that is important to consider. Um, another aspect, you know, you could sort of say, well, it is also possible that 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 elevated inflation ties into there's a direct correlation ties into the Federal Reserve saying, hey, we are going to crush it. It's possible their resolve changes as well. In which case you have Jerome Powell say, you know what, it's not 2%. Because look, this is all arbitrary figures, you know, 2%, 3%, 4%. What makes him, you know, sort of wake up in a few months from now and sort of say, oh, you know what, we're in a new normal. It's really 4%. And in that situation, oh, it's really only a 4% target. If that happens and the Federal Reserve starts easing up, then you could have a complete 
sort of reversal of the situation, but that would argue arguably mean you have elevated inflation for longer. Now, I, I'd be surprised if that happens just because, um, you know, it, he's the language he's provided at the l light, latest meeting. But, you know, it's very possible. I, I, I don't put that as a high conviction idea that that they will they will not move the, the hurdle. I actually think it's very I, I I sort of view it as sort of a coin toss, partly because of the underlying debt dynamics with the U.S., which is that the U.S. can't you know, the Federal Reserve can't raise, let's say, rates significantly above, let's say, four or five percent over time, because then it's like, oh, my gosh, there's so much public debt. It turns into this Ponzi-esque financing situation. And so there is that dynamic. So to be to be aware of uh, another core aspect to think about is like, well, wait a second, a let's say another 25 percent decline, you know, 25, 30 percent decline. And let's say the S&P 500 from here. And that only really gets you back to 2019, you know, around where the market was trading in 2019. Is that really that crazy, given the amount of stimulus and effectively, you know, easy monetary policy that we saw sort of cause things to go crazy in 2020 and 2021 in response to COVID? And arguably, I'm looking at this and sort of saying it's not like corporate earnings have just gone absolutely, you know, I don't look at this and think that's crazy to go back to 2019 levels. You know, thinking about where the economy is, thinking about the fact that the real economy is actually contracting right now. So that's that's another aspect, like thinking, is it completely unrealistic to assume a 20, 20, 30 percent drop in, let's say, the stock market, assuming the stock market crash that Bridgewater, you know, is calling out, Greg Jensen's calling out effectively. I don't think that's unreasonable to say, hey, you know, now you're back at 2019 levels, especially if you start seeing earnings actually start declining like they expect. Personally, how am I considering investing in this environment? Personally, I'm looking at this sort of I sort of view myself as an investment sniper, in all honesty, that's like, hey, let's look for things that are super compelling and then take the shot headshot, you know, like looking for these things where it's like, is this value compelling? And if the value is like sort of compelling, I might might take a little something, but I'll, I'll typically do like the bigger slugs for, you know, 10, 10 percent of my portfolio, maybe even make a bigger bet of my portfolio when something's super compelling where I'm like, oh, there's 500 percent upside from here, you know, and oftentimes that's not going to happen. You're not going to get those super compelling shots all the time. So you just sit and wait and, you know, constantly scope out different ideas. Uh, another core aspect that I'm personally doing with my own portfolio is looking down, you know, looking through each of the names and trying to figure out, OK, well, which of these companies are super sensitive to the economy? And which ones, you know, are going to hold up, which ones, you know, is there's sort of a structural thesis here. And so I'd want to be mindful, like, OK, so if this is if this company could get harmed by, let's say, much higher labor costs or much higher, you know, inflation costs, that is something I want to be mindful of or much higher inflation. Will they get harmed or will they benefit from some of my companies I'm looking at? They have large cash balances or the business inherently, you know, they have a large float. They inherently benefit from, let's say, larger, you know, higher interest rates over time. So there is that dynamic as well. So we're saying, well, if we're in this sort of new era of potentially stagflation, you know, that sort of weaker economy, higher rates, how does that play out? Do I want to own cyclical companies? Not really. I'd rather own either the companies that directly benefit or companies that are, let's say, have a secular tailwind, regardless of the environment we're in, because they're dealing with, let's say, a medical product that's growing very quickly, or they have core revenues growing 30%. And it's like, hey, this still strikes me as, you know, cheap and compelling. So that's how I'm considering my own investments, you know, in this environment, everyone has to figure out what's right for them, you know, on their own personal journey. If you enjoyed this video, effectively talk about why Bridgewater, Greg Jensen, Ray Dalio's Bridgewater is expecting a U.S. stock market crash, talking about, you know, 20 to 25 percent declines in U.S. stock, U.S. assets, suggesting around a 30 percent, maybe more decline in U.S. stocks. Please make a point of hitting that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button. And thank you for watching Unrivaled Investing.